from 12 News, this is Newsmakers. It's down to two candidates in the race to replace former Congressman David Cicilline, Democrat Gabe Amo and Republican Gary Leonard, a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, retiring as a colonel. Leonard is hoping to be the first GOP candidate to be elected in Rhode Island's first congressional district in three decades. What is his message to voters in a deep blue district? Our guest this week on Newsmakers, Republican candidate for Congress, Gary Leonard. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White, alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is Republican candidate for Congress, Gary Leonard. Gary, welcome to the program. Tim, thank you very much, Ted. Thank you very much. 60 seconds or less, Gary. Why do you want to be uh, a congressman from the 1st District of Rhode Island? Well, I jumped in this race because I, I don't like the direction our nation is going right now. I, I absolutely don't believe uh, Bidenomics is working for working families across the country, but particularly here in Rhode Island. Uh, as a 13th generation Rhode Islander I, and watching the political system, and I come from a Democrat family. My father was on the school committee at North Kingstown. Uh, I, I will tell you, I, 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 don't, I think the, this state could be governed better, but just having a little more balance in the political system. So I, want, so I jumped in for those two reasons. The other one is the divisiveness in our country right now, which I think is, is getting pushed by extremes on both sides, uh, is not healthy for a for a republic, a democratic republic, and, and, I, and I think Washington, D.C. needs leadership, people with a backbone that will stand up to, to even their own party uh, to come up with common sense solutions that work for everybody. Let's talk about that division. There's a lot of chaos right now down in Washington, and I want to ask you about two big votes in recent weeks in the House. Would you have voted for the continuing resolution that kept the government open, up and running for 45 days? I absolutely think we needed to keep that government running, so yes. So it would have been a yes vote. I, I, and, I, and I tell you that, Tim, because I've watched firsthand uh, while in the military how this affects what you're trying to do planning-wise and training-wise, which is the purpose of, of getting your forces ready, and I saw it. And I think since 2010 we've done this every single year, both parties. What is and the effect, work. if we can just go side to your past experience for a second expertise. because we yeah. hear, you know we do is most people here shut down they're like is it just theater in washington what did you see as practical effects of the you know stop and start shut down the government for six days then you all come back that kind of thing so so i'll give you my la my last command down in new orleans i was the chief of staff down there from marine forces reserve and we went through this a and a lot of your military headquarters have a bunch of civilians in it gs employees uh they go home uh during these shutdowns. Mm -hmm. The military folks, we, we kept working. Um, there were some some pullbacks, but you could not plan into the future what's going. And quite frankly, the military right now is going to struggle with it. What do you do after 40? How do you plan past 45 days right now? And it, it's it's unhealthy. And I, and I would say in New Orleans, we probably had 15 to 20 percent of our workforce was civilians, and they all went home. And uh, that that slows you down. It stops things. So the other big vote was Speaker Kevin McCarthy. He was the first person to be ousted from his role as Speaker in U.S. history. Eight hardline Republicans led by Congressman Matt Gates of Florida made that happen. How would you have voted in that instance? I, I, uh, I, can I comment on one other thing? Every single Democrat voted for that, too. Um, and this is shortly after. Yeah, but they, they knew that the Repu eight Republicans knew that was going to happen. So this is a calculated move. This was the but, eight Republicans that pushed him out. I, 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 the chaos right now in our, in our government is absolutely unhealthy. And what happened was, 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 was a tragedy. Kevin McCarthy worked across party lines to get this continuing resolution passed uh, to include the Democrats voting with him on that. And three days later, four days later, we turn around and they vote against him. I uh, uh, calculated, and I'm, and I'm wondering what the objective was, uh, the, with the eight, with eight Republicans, mm -hmm. to, to me this was absolutely unnecessary, way unnecessary at this point in time. What we need, what we need is some type of stability in Washington, D.C., and we need a level of predictability because I think it's, it's good for all of us, but it's particularly good for our economy. So you would have, bottom line, voted with the majority of the Republicans absolutely. to keep McCarthy in as speaker. A absolutely. Well, it's, uh, what's done is done. So now there's a race for speaker, a very sort of unprecedented in the middle of a Congress to be uh, having them campaigning. As of this morning, there were three. 
uh, in there in that race. Do you have a favorite candidate uh, if you were down there right now? You know, you could be there in a month if you win this election. Who you would be voting for? Ted, I am I am focused on November seventh and, and and getting out to meet every single voter that I can meet, tell them my personal story and tell them what my principles are and what and what I believe in. Uh, I'm not going to have a vote in what what happens with uh, who the whoever comes out of this. Fair enough. But, uh, you know, this is a, a big question, I would think, uh, at the moment. The biggest question is who will be the next Speaker of the House, which is the institution you want to join. Um, I'll just ask, could you see yourself supporting Jim Jordan for Speaker if you were down there, who's with the more, I guess, Trumpy um, wing of the House GOP? I, 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 would, I would be supportive of anybody that has some common sense and they can work. It, what do we have, a five-person majority down there on the Republican side. Yeah. It, it's, it's, you need to work with both sides of the aisle to get business done in Washington, D.C. So I'd be in favor of someone who can get business done in D.C. for the American people. That's the purpose of what, these, what, what, they're, what we're supposed to be doing down there. You have called for a dozen debates with your opponent, Gabe Amo. He agreed to two so far, including here on Channel 12. Uh, we caught up with Amo yesterday on Thursday. We're taping Friday morning and asked him about your demands. Here's what he had to say. Take a listen. I'm really excited to be on Channel 12 and Channel 10 uh, to really articulate uh, our vision for investing in Rhode Islanders uh, in terms of making sure that we secure Social Security and Medicare, fight gun violence, fight climate change. Uh, and while my opponent is going to have to explain why he wants to join a House uh, Republican majority that can't elect a Speaker of the House and that has us on the brink of shutdown. So I look forward to those uh, conversations on the debate stage and doing what I've done since I got into this race on April 18th, meeting people where they are. So, Gary, as uh, he said right there, the two debates are on the state's largest television stations here on Channel 12 and our friends over in Cranston. We get it. We know why you want a dozen debates. It increases your visibility. But you can't get more visibility than on the, the two big television stations in the state. But that, that's not enough for you. No, I, I, I think the voters deserve more. But, but I would tell you, I think the, the two debates we're talking about are a little too late in the cycle. I, I, I think it would, uh, and, I, and I'd ask the two of you with the, here at, the, at uh, Channel 12 to maybe see what, we, what can be done about pushing yours well, forward in time. Well, our experience on, on this is people really aren't even tuning in until uh, the waning days of uh, getting to the voting booth. So I would argue the opposite, that the timing of those debates are even better in terms of people wanting to engage in an election. I, I, and I understand what you're saying, Tim, I, I, but early voting starts on the 18th. Um, and, and I absolutely believe the voters of Rhode Island deserve an opportunity to hear both of us. Um, and, 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 I, and I understand it, it helps him by pushing these things as far into the cycle as possible. Um, but, I, but I will tell you, I think he's going to have a hard time defending uh, Bidenomics right now. I think he's going to have a hard time defending the immigration system in our country right now. I think he's going to have a hard time defending where we sit educationally in our country right now. Uh, Rhode Island... Rhode Island working families and middle class families are hurting and he doesn't want to have to defend it is my opinion and that's that's why he has not uh, accepted any challenges for debates debates earlier in the cycle and, and I think it would be again I understand what you're saying but I think it would be in the best interest of Rhode Islanders to see our debate happen week two weeks three weeks before the election. And certainly, I think some of the invitations were for earlier, uh, which is part of your point, I assume, right? He could have accepted one along with these that's earlier in the cycle. A absolutely. absolutely. There was, as far as I know, uh, we had accepted eight. Um, off the top of my head, I can't recall what the, what the organizations were. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I understand Channel 12 and Channel 10 are the two biggest outlets. Um, and it's important. You got to the order out. right, too. That's important. Um, <laughs> so let's, well, we have you in front of us, and you're talking to Rhode Islanders now, so let's keep talking about what you would do if you were in the House. I always like to ask uh, candidates for Congress this because it can tell you a lot. A lot of the work happens in committees in the House and Senate mm -hmm. down there. If you got down there and they said, all right, Mr. Leonard, you want a big upset in Rhode Island, you can have any committee assignment you want, what committee in the House would you ask to be put on uh, and why? I appreciate the question. I, I, I think personally I am uh, with my background would be a perfect fit for the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, but for Rhode Island, um, I think I'd be better served uh, being on the committee that deals with the workforce uh, and appropriations that, deal, that deals with housing. Uh, we know we have a housing challenge in the state of Rhode Island right now. I think we're 2,000 units short across the state. 
Uh, we've got a supply and demand problem that's, that's it's not helping working families. If you take a police officer and a teacher and they get married, they're probably going to live in Massachusetts or, or Connecticut. Um, so I, I would like to be on, a, on committees down there that actually can affect and help Rhode Islanders. Somewhere down the road, uh, if Senator Reid sometimes disappears uh, or retires, um, maybe at that point move on to something like the House, House Armed Services Committee, if I'm privileged enough uh, by the voters of Rhode Island to elect me to this position. I am curious with your military background, an increasing number of Republicans have balked at uh, continued U.S financial support for the war in Ukraine, would you support or oppose additional military aid to Ukraine? And I've, I've gone on, Tim, I've gone on record a few times with, mm -hmm. with respect to uh, Ukraine. Uh, clear violation of international law. Um, we, I think we all agree, it doesn't matter what party you sit in, that, that Putin's a thug. And, and I, I absolutely believe the steps we took, but uh, the White House took initially, um, were, the, were the right appropriate steps. However, uh, our president, uh, deserve, we deserve to know what, particularly when you're sitting in the military, but, it, but every American, what our strategic objective is and, 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 and make it clear. Um, we also need to know what the exit strategy is. And what I saw in Afghanistan with the money that we pumped in there that we didn't have a lot of accountability of, that now I think is sitting in mansions uh, in the Persian Gulf. Um, there needs to be some measures that, that no kidding, we're auditing exactly what's going on with our money. Um, and so I, how would you vote? In, in the, I mean, it's a yes or no. It's so a down vote. But in the context of this, the context of this is also we need to take a look at China because China's watching what's going on here. Um, and, and I absolutely believe they are, their ambitions are on Taiwan sometime in the future. Um, so again, our steps were the right ones. Um, and, and in the near future, I think we continue to fund this effort, but uh, I don't think this is a, uh, we're writing blank checks uh, for the foreseeable future. I also don't think America uh, wants to see another 20 year war or 20 year in involvement in a 20 year war like we did in Afghanistan. I have to ask you about your party's front runner at the moment for president, Donald Trump. Uh, I know New England Republicans don't always love this topic, but it's an important one. Um, brass tacks, are you supporting Trump right now? And even if you're not, would you support him if he is nominated next year for president? I, I will. Next year, uh, ne this year, I am focused on my election uh, and this election in 2023. Um, I will support whomever the Republican candidate is in 2024. Um, but I, but I will, and you've heard me say this. I, I am uh, what I define as a New England Yankee Republican, um, and and I've been in leadership positions my entire life. I can stand on my two feet. I got a strong backbone and I will, I will go to Washington DC to vote how I feel the, the folks of Rhode Island would, would best benefit from that vote. And that includes crossing party lines to come up with some common sense solutions. Climate change is a growing concern uh, to safety, health, the economy across the globe, but especially coastal states like Rhode Island. What policies, briefly, uh, would you support to address climate change? I, I, uh, I'm never brief, and I apologize. Well, we have a limited amount of <laughs> yeah, time on this left, show. So. Just told us. I, I, uh, I, I know the other side is talking about this being the existential threat to our country. I don't think it's the existential threat to our country. I think it's important that we have clean water, clean air, uh, that we're not worried about flood, flood insurance, and, and, and the rest of the environmental damage. Um, but I think the existential threat to our country is our national debt, and it's absolutely unsustainable. Right now, the ratio of GDP to debt is somewhere around 120, 118, and that ought to be about 60. Um, and and we, need to, we need to start Worry. We can worry about the climate, but we need to be worried about what type of country we're leaving for our grandkids and great grandkids. And I think economically, all great countries and, and great empires have come to a finish because they've economically imploded for overspending. I have to ask you two quick campaign questions before we go to the break. First, um, roughly how much cash on hand are you going to be reporting that you had for the September 30th deadline? Uh, Roughly is fine. But about two hundred. About two hundred thousand dollars. Do you expect you'll be able to run television advertisements as part of your campaign in the final weeks? That, that that's the plan. I think it's important. We've already recorded a couple, but uh, we'll we'll see how the money stacks up. We'll keep uh, keep fighting for for contributions. We're getting some momentum, and, and I'm pro I'm probably putting a little bit more money of my own into this. 
because right. I think it's that important. Republican candidate for Congress, Gary Leonard, thanks for joining us on the program. Is that it? That's <laughs> it. You, you survived. <laughs> yeah, All you right. did. When we come back, a political roundtable with 12 News political analyst, Jill Fleming. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. He's Ted Nisi. And we're joined by 12 News political analyst Joe Fleming for a political roundtable. So first half guest was Republican Gary Leonard running for Congress. Um, what's his path to victory here, Joe? I mean, <laughs> CD1 is, as I said in the open of this program, deep blue. Very. So um, it, how could it happen? It would be very, very unlikely to happen. But there's always a possibility. I mean, a district's like the plus 18 Democratic. You have very strong Democratic areas. He has very little name recognition at this point. It's a month away. He has not been up on TV yet. So I'm not sure what his path is. I'm sure they feel they have a path that might work. But at the same time, you have a Democratic candidate who just had a hard-fought primary who got a lot of momentum as a result of that primary. So I think it's going to be a very difficult chance for a Republican to win. I mean, the last Republican from the seat was Ron Makeley. Yeah, in the mid-'90s. In the mid-'90s, but also he had a couple things going for him. Freddie St. Germain, who we defeated, had a Democratic primary against Scott Wolf, only barely won. And then Makeley was able to defeat St. Germain. Well, and we St. Germain was plagued by scandal exactly. in 1988 exactly. when he lost. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't have that right here. So, I mean, it's going to be a very difficult path if there's any path at all. Well, w would the path be, uh, you know, to both of you, be a really low turnout? So Gabe Amo <laughs> is um, caught sleeping or takes it yeah, for granted? Yeah, I mean, he, you would need, yeah. you know, I always think back to Martha Coakley. Um, in and Massachusetts, her, in Mass run for governor. Ru or Senate. Senate, When she ran me. for U.S. Senate. Scott Brown. She did later run for governor, right? Yeah. And lost that, too. Yeah. Um, when she ran for U.S. Senate in 20, in the special election to fill Ted Kennedy's seat, um, it's, they were overconfident in the Coakley campaign. You had a strong candidate in Scott Brown, a Republican. It was a special election like this, so the right. dynamics were weird. It was also winter in New England. Mm -hmm. The Obama backlash was happening. Uh, Coakley made multiple missteps in the campaign trail. Famously, like, Fenway. didn't care about the Red Sox at Fenway. <laughs> right. Yeah, yes. it was, I can't remember the details Do you expect anymore. me to oh, shake yeah. hands? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and so just to say, things can happen. That was Massachusetts, you know, and, and but... It's, it doesn't, at the moment, feel like that no. is where this race is. You would have to get the Democrats to stay home in all the strong areas, Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls, one socket, and all the Republicans in the first district, and there's not a lot of them, all to come out and vote. They would have to target all these Republicans and motivate them to get them out, hoping the Democrats stay home. That's the only path I can see. And we were talking about this um, a little in the in the meeting, but the three of us, before we the show today, and... Uh, you know, the, the the good news for Republicans in Rhode Island is that they always start with a good 30-ish percent of the vote. Right. We see that consistently. Governor's races, Senate races, congressional races. The challenge is how do you grow that vote from 32 percent, we'll say, or so, to the, in this case, probably 51 percent, 50 percent plus one that you need. And we saw it. Alan Fung was a perfect example last year. He brought things to the table. He had money. He had national support. He had a strong geographic base in Cranston. Um, he was running as a more moderate candidate. And he inched forward through that, you know, to 40 percent, to 42 percent. But he stalled out at 47 percent and Seth Magaziner got 50. The, the first district is like over 50 percent Democratic. The Republican has to give the voters a reason not to vote for the Democrat. And that hasn't happened yet. So the voters will go with a normal voting pattern, which is Democratic. Or the Democratic candidate has to give a reason right. not to vote right. if something, if something <laughs> would pop up. And that was up. the other thing. The other thing with, before the primary we talked about was if Sabina Matos had won and was still right. being shadowed by the, the, yep. the signature scandal, right. she would have been a more damaged nominee. Maybe mm -hmm. Leonard could have made something out of that. Aaron Regenberg, as a further left than usual Democrat who was attacked by Patrick Kennedy, the former congressman in this district, that could have given him an issue. Gabe Amo is, is just sort of a mainstream, yep. clearly widely accepted Democrat. That's among the Democrats. Yep. That's why he won the primary more handily than expected. And I think that's why you heard Leonard there yep. talking about Bidenomics, right. trying him to the president. The president is not super popular. Um, but it's also about getting that message across to enough people. Right. And at this point, he hasn't done that. Now, he says he's going to be going up on TV, but when? It's going to be the last two weeks. That could be too late. Or can he get up there earlier with some money and try to get a message out there? First, he has to let the voters know who he is mm -hmm. and then give them reasons why to vote for him over Gabe. And the other reason, I just, and I like to 
help the viewers understand. It's not like we're just burying the poor guy and he, as an right. underdog. The other thing I'm, I've been watching for, is there any sign the National Republicans see this race as competitive? Uh, you Why know, would they after uh, Alan Fung and, well, and, that's and the, Seth Magaziner? I, I agree, but at the same time, I try to watch the signs and maybe something has changed. Maybe there was a poll. Maybe, they, But mm-hmm. frankly, I'm still getting uh, statements from the National Republicans regularly attacking Magaziner. But right. not Gabe Amo, who's currently on the ballot in a month, which mm. just says to me, they've written that off. Now, sometimes the National Party writes off a campaign and someone manages to win anyway, but it's yet another sign of, of how, how very uphill this, this race is. Well, and I guess the, the, you know, the other thing to think about with that is uh, with Alan Fung and Seth Magaziner, there were a lot of races across right. the country, yes. and uh, the, power, uh, was, the power balance was you know, mm-hmm. up exactly. for election. Mm-hmm. That's not happening here. No. It's an off-year special election, that, but yet still the National Party doesn't seem well, to be parachuting into Rhode Island. Well, especially if they don't see district. a path to victory. If they don't see a path to victory, they're not going to throw hundreds of thousands of dollars in a seat where, okay, they may move it from 30% to 35%. They're still going to lose. So why throw the money in? They're saying, look at CD2. We have a better chance to move the voters there than the CD1 in 24. All right. We'll come back to this in a minute. But I do want to touch on this uh, because I caught some of this interview and I want you to talk about it. We asked Gary Leonard about the chaos in Washington. Uh, Speaker McCarthy out. You talked to uh, Massachusetts Congressman Jake Auchincloss about his vote. In he time. was, and of course, one of the Democrats, because all of them, including Seth Magaziner and Bill Keating, voted to oust McCarthy. Uh, and so I asked him about the criticism that Democrats, you know, shouldn't have reinforced that faction of the Republicans uh, who were, you know, interested in sowing yeah. chaos. Here's what Auchincloss uh, had to say. Did the Democrats incentivize or disincentivize any bipartisanship, meaning the next speaker will be even less likely to not shut down the government and things like that. I mean, what do you say to that idea that whether McCarthy was, in your eyes, a good actor or not, that it's just you got to take the best Republican you had on offer, and maybe that was him? The currency of speakership in Congress is trust. And Kevin McCarthy had gone bankrupt. His own conference did not trust him because he lied to them. And Democrats did not trust him because repeatedly he would make a promise either to the president or to Democrats, and then he would renege upon it under pressure from Trump and the MAGA wing. So there's no negotiation to be had when there's no trust as the basis of it. As I've said, as the Democratic minority leader has said repeatedly, we are very cognizant in the House that we're in the minority. If we want to pass policy, we're going to need Republican votes on immigration reform, on lowering health care costs. And I'm personally invested in this. I've got legislation that has Republican co-sponsors. So we are not blind to the fact that you've got to have Republican uh, votes to pass what we want to do. But we're not going to be fooled for a third time with somebody who has repeatedly uh, gone back on his word. Well, Congressman uh, Jake Auchincloss on why he voted to oust uh, Kevin McCarthy, his explanation, but it's not surprising. I mean, that the Democrats would uh, do that. We've talked a lot about the first congressional race, Ted. I do want to touch on um, an, the another sort of heated race that's happening over the border in Fall River. Yeah, so um, we have, of course, it's an off year, which means Massachusetts and Bristol County, they're having their mayoral uh, elections all, all same day as the special election in Rhode Island on November 7th. And you have incumbent Mayor Paul Coogan, you see there, will be facing Sam Sutter, the former mayor who served a year, was out- ousted by Chazel Correa, who is now in jail or prison. Um, so these two, Coogan had a very strong showing in the preliminary mm-hmm. election, so he's seen as pretty strong going into this, but he does have a... Uh, you know, well-known top-tier opponent in Sutter. So this is one to watch. We're going to do a debate for this later in October. Um, But it's really the only of those uh, Bristol County, Massachusetts mayoral races that has any heat to it. I do want to show New Bedford, the second biggest city in this TV market. Uh, Mayor John Mitchell uh, will be facing Tyson Moultrie, but uh, Mitchell won with almost 70% of the vote in the preliminary round this week against a whole bunch of opponents Nobody thinks this one uh, is much of a race. So a pretty quiet year. Um, what was the turnout in that? Six percent. That is that's just terrible. Six percent. It's it's really. I did that story earlier this year, yes. Tim, about uh, you know the push um, from some of the reform groups in Massachusetts to fo- frankly to follow Rhode Island, which Central has Falls. moved Central Falls, Woonsocket. Right. They've moved mm-hmm. their mayoral elections into even numbered years because it is just really hard in this day and age to convince voters to come out for lower profile elections in an off year, but. So far, no appetite for that in these Bristol County cities. So while we're seeing turnout of 6%, 
Well, Joe, we have a minute left. Yep. Speaking of turnout, I'm going to ask you to predict what the turnout is going to be uh, for the general election in CD1. Tim, this is going to be very difficult. I know the other day there was like 5,000 mail ballots applied for, but some of those are people who get them all the time, so we don't know if they're going to be returned. I'll be interested to see when the early voting starts how big that number gets. This turnout could be as small as 40,000 or as large as 40,000 <laughs> because there's been really no interest in this race at all at this point with a month out. At least in the primary, campaigns were gearing up at this point. Here, it's been very, very quiet. So I don't know how motivated the, Dem the Democrats and Republicans are going to be to get out and vote. But both candidates have to push their voters out to push that turnout up. And just to put that in perspective, 40,000 would mean same turnout for the general election right. for as the primary. primary. Right. Yeah. And that was even a little bit higher than we thought. And we have 10 seconds high left end, here. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was the higher than what we thought. Okay. So, I mean, we're Joe, keeping low. Joe Fleming. Thank you very much for your time. As always, he's Ted Nisi. If you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week.